Hey everyone, welcome to episode 18 of The Corner Blue. I'm Andres Rico, I'm here with Hugo Alvarado, and it's great to spend some time with you. I know it sounds a little bit cheesy, but when you stop and think about it, it's just amazing that people are listening to the podcast, and ever so slowly or slightly, we're growing that base of, of audience members, so we appreciate the comments the likes, the follows, and the feedback that we get in general. It's its duly appreciated. But today we have a special episode. We kind of stalled uh, for one day due to, to health issues. And today we were able to talk with one of the most interesting signings for the Salvadoran League during this offseason, none other than Tomas Granito, a former U-20 World Cup player for El Salvador. He's born in El Salvador from an Argentine uh, family, grew up in the U.S., so he's been all over the place. And we just go over his story on how was it that he ended up reconnecting with the Salvadoran roots and playing for La Selecta. And also what was behind his taking on this pretty interesting step in his career of signing for FAS for this current tournament in El Salvador. How you doing, Hugo? Doing well. Uh, always nice to. Seems like lately we've been catching up with some of those players that we were hanging out with in in Turkey. So um, yeah, I always um, enjoy these conversations. Uh, Tomas is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very good player, and Fas is really, really, um, you know, signing a lot of a lot of attract uh, attractive players. Um, Speaking soccer wise, uh, Guli Pena, Tomas Granito. I know that there was some tweet there about Tomas Granito um, from some uh, a, a, a journalist presenter in El Salvador. Um, but yes, I think it's going to be interesting to see Fast with El Guli Pena, Tomas Granito, uh, Dustin Correa, who just signed with Fast. So, yeah, it's always, you know, it's always good to see some of those players that have um, started uh, form their soccer career in the U.S., uh, you know, go back to El Salvador and bring something at uh, a higher level to our, our local league. And, you know, Tomas is, is, is it's, it's one of a kind in terms of his story where, you know, he's two parents are from Argentina, but he was born in El Salvador and lived five years in El Salvador. Then he moved to, moved to the U.S., uh, was part of the U.S. youth national team's pool. And then, you know, he played one year in college and Tucuarafado took him to the to the World Cup. So, um, yeah, a very, very nice conversation. Always good to learn about you know his how he associates uh the his himself with the with the cultures obviously salvadorian american argentinian and and yeah i'm looking forward to him having a successful season uh hopefully get called back to the to the national team he's been in the radar in the last couple of years last game he played was against Iceland and obviously 20, 2020 didn't have much, you know, due to the pandemic. So yeah, wishing him uh, a good season this year with FAS. Yeah. He's one of those players that has gone against the grain um, in the sense that he makes his pro debut in this world with Firpo. He's one of the few players from, La Azulita, the World Cup Azulita that has been able to maintain his career up until this point. And on top of that, he's one of the few players that have made that jump from playing in the U.S. to El Salvador. Um, because, and I've seen it during the press this whole week uh, in El Salvador and conversations on Twitter, that, you know, aside from Mayen, it's been highlighted, there haven't been too many players from the U.S. that have been able to find long-term success in the league and in Sarbalod for various reasons. And that is something that has held true. Um, you know, you had players that have found success in spurts. Uh, 
just as Dustin Correa uh, did, who just re-signed with FAS. This is his third time joining the club, so it'll be interesting to see if he's able to reach any consistency uh, for FAS. I also saw that Chalate signed Efraín Burgos Jr. We'll see if he's able to find that uh, continuity because he's had stints in the league in El Salvador, but hasn't been able to consolidate himself. So we're hoping that, you know, someone like Tomas that has been going against the grain is able to find that that success because it seemed that, yeah, he's he's taken those leaps of faith. So I'll always go back to it uh, from our conversation with uh, Richard Mejia. But yeah, he, he is a player that takes those leaps of faith and you, you do want to see them rewarded uh, for him. But without much further ado, let's jump into the interview. Let's do it. Boom. So, Tomas, thanks for being with us, man. Um, are you currently in Santana right now, or are you living in San Salvador, or where are you living now? No, I, uh, I'm renting out an apartment here in Santa Tecla. Nice. Um, and I drive to to Santana for for trainings and games. But I'm here. I have a nice apartment. I'm comfortable. So you know, I settled in nicely. Yeah, no, Santa Tecla is a, a nice, nice suburb of San Salvador for those that that um, aren't too sure about it. And I, I actually lived in Santa Tecla for a little bit, but that was way back in 1996. Yeah, okay, that's a nice yeah. area. I like it. So, how how long is the commute from Tecla to Santana? Uh, well, it depends. Usually, without traffic, it's like 35, 40 minutes. But they're fixing a street, so sometimes. Um, it could take a bit more. It could take like an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. Sometimes when traffic hits hard here, it's, it's tough, you know? Um, yeah. So it kind of just, it kind of just depends on the day. So, you know, you know, just to make sure we're on time, we leave like an hour and a half, almost two hours for training every day. Yeah. Sounds like a good move. Cause yeah, things can, can get pretty messy there. Uh, especially when it's yeah. like a free for all trying to get somewhere. Well, that's cool, man. What have been your sensations uh moving back to Salvador because obviously you spent a lot of time in the country it was in 2013 right when you played with Firpo yeah 2013 after the uh, after the U20 World Cup a uh, couple months later uh uh that's when I signed yeah a couple months later and in August I signed in with Firpo mm -hmm. for that for that tournament and every time I just got back to El Salvador after that was just with the national team so mm -hmm. until then um 2019 i was with the national team um i would just come back here maybe take like a week or two weeks of camp you know uh preseason and then national team camp and then i would leave or we would go back to the states to play friendly so it was just you know airport hotel training hotel and you know but now that i've been back here i signed with fasa you know i'm I'm really happy to be back. Uh, it's nice to come back here in my roots uh, where I was born, you know, to to live here, to experience everything. Um, it's something that I wanted to do for a while now. And coming here with FOSS is something, you know, very special for me. I bet. Uh, in terms of being back, living there, does it feel different than when you were there eight years ago? Um, are you more familiarized with things? You can get around a lot better, obviously, with all the experience that you have. So th does it feel more like home? Have you had an easier time settling in this time around? Yeah, I think uh, I definitely have uh, an easier time. Also, because, you know, you get to know a lot more people. You get to meet a lot more people here that could, you know, help you out with anything, give you suggestions. Um, you make friends, you know, living here. So... I made uh, friends with good people back when I was in FIFA and I stayed connected now that I'm back here. And, you know, I, I, I know, you know, um, the lifestyle. I know what to expect coming here. So I think, like you said, that experience, I have that advantage uh, this way around here. That's cool, man. And um, in terms of your, your signing with FAS, could you walk us through the motions of how that came up? Um, uh, the stage that you find yourself in your career? Why was it that something like signing with FAS or playing in a set bowler was something that was appealing to you or you thought would be the next correct step for your career? Yeah. Um, first of all, Sarko, the, the, the coach, you know, contacted me, uh, spoke with me, wanted me to, 
to share his idea of the project, of his experience here, of you know what his goals are, what his plans are, and it sounds like a, some something really you know motivating. Um, it seemed like a really good opportunity to come here to FOSS, you know, um, especially at a time where, you know, there are other leagues, uh, for example, in the States that uh, they're not playing. You don't know. He wasn't sure when some leagues would get back uh, into playing. There wasn't an official date. And, and it's, it's very important for a professional player, you know, to, to stay active, uh, to be playing, to get games in, um, and having an opportunity to come here with FAS. I had a really good um, off season workout over there in Miami where I was doing it and I felt good. I felt ready to, to start a new season. Uh, this opportunity came through and I wanted to take it. Um, I got a lot of messages from the fans here in FAS, which was really motivating, you know, and um, I think it's, it's a good step in my career. It's a good step, it's a big club here. And I'm motivated to be here, man, and to uh, and to win this, to, to win a championship here. So it's good to, uh, in addition to everything you just shared, to be closer to the national team, given that the World Cup qualifiers are coming up. Was that also a factor that you took into consideration before making your decision to go go back to El Salvador? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, I think as a player and being part of, of the national team, uh, the past two years, um, it's, it's always on your mind to, you know, considering, and when you have to make a choice to see like, to where are you going to go? If you're going to sign, if this is going to help you out, if this is going to help you, you know, with the national team, it's, it's always in your head. It's always a, a decisive factor, you know, when, when you bring on new opportunities and it's always in, in, in my mind, of course. And I thought, you know, um, Staying active, playing here, playing an important role in, in this big team, it's a good opportunity for sure with the national team. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've seen, well, we've all been able to see what El Sarco has been able to do with Alianza, especially at an international level, which seems like it's like the last frontier in terms of uh, the threshold that Salvadoran clubs have to kind of reach or, or pass. But it does seem exciting when someone like Esarco goes to yet another big club like FAS. And I'm a fascista, so I'm pretty stoked about that myself. <laughs> but yeah, you do hope that he's able to replicate it. And I was able to watch uh, one of your guys' matches. I think it was the, who were you guys playing? It was when you guys won 4-1, I think. Against Sonsonate. Yes. I think yes, it was yes, last yes. week, yeah. Yeah, against Sonsonate. And the mid was looking pretty good what are your sensations uh returning to the league in terms of speed um just the idiosyncrasies of the league things that you still think you need to get used to things like that yeah well that was my it was the second game of the season it was my first game starting um it was my first game starting it was the first home game of of the team in, in this tournament so there was a lot of expectations you know um, in the midfield that, that I was playing there with also Guli Peña, a really known, uh, you know, Mexican player. Um, so we definitely felt the pressure, but we know we know that we're at a good level. We're still, we're still getting used to the team, you know, and that's probably my main focus. Um, but I had a really good game. You know, I, I felt like um, I was a big part in controlling the midfield, you know, controlling the ball the speed of play. Um, so I was really happy with, with my individual play. And of course the team, which, which one for one. So it was a really good debut um, in a Quiteño. And with this uh, fase uno that they call it, um, it's not necessary that the games matter in terms of qualifying for the next round, but as a player, is it a benefit that, you know, they're basically exhibition matches, if you want to call them that, or uh, do you think it would have been better just to jump into just the full-fledged competition? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I see it both ways. Also, maybe the last tournament, it was the same, you know, where the first couple of games were exhibition um, because you were also starting from, from the pandemic where everybody, you know, um, there was a long period without play, and I understand but after that tournament, I felt like, you know, I'm confident. And I'm, I, I, I'm guessing that other players as well, they think they felt confidence to do a regular season how, how they've always done it. You know, they, 
they already played one tournament and this tournament I felt they were ready for it. Um, I thought it would be really exciting to have, you know, the original tournament, like, like how it always is. Um, but, you know, uh, we still, we still take these exhibition games. Like if it were a regular season game, you know, we play for pride, we play for this big club, you know, the pressure that we have and looking at it uh, as a positive note, you know, it just gives you, it just gives you games to get to know your, your, your teammates, um, the soccer here, of course, which is, which is different. Um, the style of play, the, the trainings, and you know, it's just, it's a good. I, I take it as a good opportunity to, you know, to get familiar with everything, so you're ready when it's really counting. What are the main differences that you noticed? I mean, obviously, you you're um, a well seasoned player now. Uh, when your your first time in El Salvador with football, you were you were young. You know, you had just Uh, finished the U20 World Cup obviously there were a lot of expectations I think for all of those players uh, who who went to the World Cup and and you know finding big clubs I mean you were one of the players that was talked about a lot um, I remember in, in Turkey where where we met there were yeah. several players that were in the radar of different clubs and your name was there um, but now that you've been through NASL and, and USL championship, and now you're back with a big club in El Salvador. What are the, the differences, in your opinion, between the two leagues, the, the, obviously the style of play and, and the, the trainings? Uh, what are the, the, the differences that you notice between what you have experienced in the U.S. and now in El Salvador? Yeah, well... Uh... It's 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 really different, you know, with you know, with my experience over there, like you said, with NASL, USL, uh debuting in the MLS as well, you know, I got I got used to the type of soccer that's in the US. Here it's you know, it's different. I feel like here's here's a probably over there, I think they're more prepared or they will focus a bit more tactically, you know. Uh They put a bit more emphasis on that. Here is probably more um, kind of run and and hit more. Um, you know, a bit more, a bit more violent. Definitely, you know, um, the game flows a lot freer here, which is something you know. It, it might seem like a small thing, but you got to get used to, you know, as a player, knowing that you're not always going to get calls that you think that are fouls or. You know, uh, it's just it's just the way it is over here, um, and the trainings um they're a lot longer here over there they're you know the trainings are an hour 15 an hour 20 tops with really good intensity you know always focusing on passing possession and then some games at the end uh as a typical training session is short and it's sharp and it's in you know it's a very intense and then and then you're free here it's probably a bit slower a bit longer Um, say trainings could be up to two hours, you know, two hours and 15 minutes, which in my opinion, sometimes could get a big heavy on a player, you know, um, especially when, when you have two or three games in, in the week, um, it's just, you know, these are things that I'm, you know, I'm adapting to it. I first saw it, like you said, when I was in fearful and now I'm, I'm experiencing here, here again. And also uh, the fields and the conditions that one plays here, you know, um, not all field, not all the fields are the same. You got to get used to it. I mean, like in USL, MLS, you know, you know, all the fields that are very nice pitches, either their turf or their grass. And then here, you know, they're not all fields are the same. They're on the same uh, sizes. It's just, you know, you have to focus a bit more here on, on adjusting to the day of the game, you know, and it's something that I'm learning uh, and it's, it's only helping me grow as a player. So these are key things that, you know, I noticed definitely here with, with the U.S. One of the things that uh, Salvadorian players, and especially when we see the national team, where we see them struggling when they play against, you know, teams in the U.S. or speaking national team level, Whenever they go out of El Salvador and, and they play in nice fields, we see that the Salvadorian player has a, a very hard time adjusting to the speed of play, uh, to the way that the ball runs. It's faster, yes. Right. So 
for you as a player who's, you know, you're very technical, you, you, you're very precise with your passing, um, obviously playing in, in, in El Salvador where the pitches can be very, very bumpy sometimes. Unstable, how do you, yeah. how, how yeah. do you adjust? How do you adjust to, to, to that? Especially when, I mean, of course, if you're playing a long ball, uh, that's a different story, but that's, not the style in El Salvador necessarily. So how do you adjust to a field that doesn't really help you with the, your style of play? Yeah. Well, it's something that I'm working on. Like you say, uh, it might seem like a small detail, but as a player, it's actually a big factor, you know, um, like you say, when me, then my main focus as a player, one of, I feel like my best attributes, it's, it's playing quickly and playing, you know, through balls, passes, long balls, kind of distributing the the play. That's my main focus as, as a center midfield. And here, I know that I sometimes cannot play one touch like I would like to because, you know, you don't know how the ball is going to get to you. You have to secure it. You have to take two touches. Uh, the speed of the ball, you might have to hit it a bit harder than usual because the grass could be a couple inches longer, you know, and thicker. Um So it's it, like I said, it's something that 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 you adapt here, and then it, it's different because, like you say, when the speed of play is outside, when the grass is shorter, they wet the field. It's a it's a it's a really nice pitch. Um, the speed is faster, and you know, physically, you have to be prepared for that. Mentally, you have to be prepared for that. You know, your your mind has to be thinking a lot quicker uh, when when the speed of the game is faster. You know, and it's something that you know. Uh, you get that by training over and over again on that particular pitch, in my opinion. So, you know, those are factors that make a big difference in, in the style of play that's in the U.S. and here in the, in El Salvador. And to compare a little bit more in terms of the, the cultural connections, because your family's from Argentina, you're born in El Salvador, and then you grew up in the U.S. Um, what are some of, like, the the differences or in, in culture between the three countries or what are the things that you've noticed the differences or some of the similarities and how has that defined you as a person? Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny because I go to Argentina and over there, I'm, I'm a gringo. I'm an American in the U S you know, I'm Hispanic. I in El Salvador here, even here, they, they call me a gringo or El Che from Argentina. So everywhere I go, they see me as, somewhere you know different uh, and you learn a lot you know I, I grew up watching you know Argentinian soccer which was probably my first motivation um, because of my parents they would be watching and my family's from Argentina so that's what would be on TV um, and, and and you get to learn you know their culture the style of play also me you know uh, being born in El Salvador and, and living up till I was five or five six years old You know, I kind of grew up here and like in, in those years are really important for your, you know, your natural just formation, going to school and all of that. And then growing up in the States, you learn all the different cultures. You know, um, I think I'm very blessed to be able to experience that. And I get and I'm so familiar with, you know, all the three cultures. So I think it's something really interesting. And I feel like in my game, I have part of of each culture that. Um, that I kind of, it's just kind of grew up in me as I was getting older, you know, and, you know, watching young, like I said, Argentinian soccer, also Salvadorian soccer playing here, you know, uh, debuting here, playing here in the world cup with the national team and growing up playing in the U S you know, you get probably a little bit of everything. So I think I'm blessed in that way. Definitely. And how could you break that down? Because obviously each country has its own, Uh, soccer identity or soccer culture obviously here in the U.S. it's it's still developing and it's pretty mixed because of all the different cultures that that kind of come together in this country but do you think you could br break it down a little bit of some of the characteristics from from each place I mean I know it's very abstract and whatnot yeah but. <laughs> it's, it's tough because you know sometimes like I said in my style of play I kind of don't you know sometimes I'm just I mean, not, not just the, the way I see soccer, you know, in general, mm -hmm. the way I see soccer, like I, I see how Argentinians see, see the game. I learned here how they see the game, how the U.S. sees the game growing up playing there. I, I mean, 
to be honest, I don't know how to how to with details answer your question, man. Like I know good, I have man. a little bit of everything, and sometimes in the field I I see things or I'm doing things that I watched from Argentina when I was young. And you know, like subconsciously I'm doing them on the field or watching things, other things from El Salvador growing up, you know. Uh, and other things from the U.S. where I grew up playing. Um, like, it's, it kind of just comes natural to me in every way. It's not one particular thing that I could, you know. For sure. I, that's the best answer I could give you, man. Sorry. No, it, it's all good, man. Because, yeah, because, you know, I don't know, the stereotype of Argentinian soccer is like a a higher so- soccer IQ, using space, very technical, and then just like garra, you know, just playing – all out and in the u.s more tactical frontal more physical you could say would be like the stereotype that i feel uh, that at least i've perceived and then in Salvador, i guess like we're kind of like a hybrid of a lot of stuff because we have mexico so close but since there are the big arch rival and we're the underdog we don't like looking to them for influences so we've kind yeah. of had to look outside of that so i feel like there's a little bit of you know, the technical aspect definitely is something that I feel is pretty commonplace in this world with players. Um, like if you go to like any of like Ambetas or fields like that, like you see like a pretty good level of of like technical ability that's just natural. But I feel like in the in a broader sense, yeah, what you mentioned that there's like a lack of of tactics uh in general that we're more it's more technical and yeah, wanting to win. I mean- I, I've always said, just like you said, I've always said that the Salvadorian player had is a very technical player, very very technical player. I've always said it. Every time I come, I see it. You know, with with many players, they're not probably the biggest guys. You know, they're not the tallest. You know, Salvador's not the tallest team, but they're you know they're very very technical and and I see myself definitely you know belonging in there and also having or in Argentina where they they really learn how to take care of the ball, you know, having that touch, having that control of the game, that balance, that IQ. Um, and then in the U.S., yeah, in the U.S., is it's a lot – They it's a lot more uh, tactical. They work a lot more tactically. They, you know, they show videos. They speak one-on-ones and trainings. Um, they set up – every little detail, you know, uh, throwings, goal kicks, free kicks, everything you have to go, you know, every player knows where to be. They're showing everything, you know, and I think that's obviously in today's soccer, it's a very important factor more than how the, you know, many here, they just say put away all that just, you know, go and bust your balls off. But, um, Sometimes tactically, it's just no matter how hard you could try and run, you know, the ball always moves faster than the player, man. So there's, you know, uh, something that um, I feel like uh, many teams here could could work a bit more on that for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Just kind of reaching that level of preparation that would make the players' jobs a lot easier. Because I feel like, like you mentioned, some of the, the aspects of infrastructure Um, some of the amenities available to you guys it kind of detracts a little bit but I feel like you know I I admire the fact that you're willing to take that step of going to Sarbalod and keeping things in mind for yourself that yeah this is something positive for your career and 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 I wish you the best in that aspect that yeah that you have a a great tournament man because I think the more clubs that are stable in Sarbalod obviously the better uh you know, the more marquee clubs, if if they're able to create more noise, there's more competition uh, for that trophy. It's going to garner even more attention, especially if they continue to do well at, uh, at the uh, CONCACAF Champions League level. Because, I mean, you have Aila that's been pretty stable the last couple of tournaments. Santa Tecla has kind of gotten downhill a little bit, but it seems that they m- might be trying to find the right pieces to correct it. Alianza obviously has been like, the the most uh what, what could you say the the most stable club of the last couple of years and being able to go yeah. outside and get nice results and 
Um, yeah, you so you just want to see more of the, I guess, the bigger clubs in the Sarbalod go back to to being big because it seemed like there have only been one or two clubs per tournament that seem to have their stuff together. And I think a signing like you definitely adds that marquee to the league. Like just looking at Fasa's lineup, this tournament is pretty, you know, the, it's a big difference than, than last season. And I think hopefully now that Sadiqal has been able to bring his pieces together, you guys will be able to have a great tournament. Yeah, man, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, I really think we have a team to fight for the championship. Um, we have, a re- I think we have a really good team. We're still working on it, you know, we're still fixing different pieces. Um, but at times the team looks really good, you know, uh, at times the team looks really good and that's motivating. And, you know, as a player here, I know how much pressure we have from the fans that they won a championship, you know, as, as being one of the biggest clubs here. Um, it's a big challenge for me, man. It's a big challenge. So and that's what was motivating for me to, to come take this opportunity, come back to my country, play here, you know, and not, and not the best, not the easiest, you know, um, circumstances, I would say, you know, it was a challenge, but I'm happy to be here. We're working and it, I see it as a great opportunity in, in my career, man. Definitely. Ooh. Going back Rewinding the tape a little bit, Tomas. <laughs> Obviously, you lived five years in El Salvador, then you lived in the U.S. You play, started playing your college career here. When did you realize that, or when did you have an awareness that playing for La Selecta was a possibility for you? Was that something that you always had in the back of your head, back of your mind, or were you more like, you know, I possibly play for the U.S. or I'm hoping to play for Argentina at some point. Uh, was that always in your radar that at some point El Salvador could be a possibility? Like, when did that hit you that playing for La Selecta was something that might be out there for you? Well, to be honest, you know, I, I've never received any contact from them, from the Federation or, you know, from anybody from here in El Salvador until I was until I was 19 when I when I was 18 I would be going to I was with the U.S. national team I was going to to national camps at the time I wasn't a citizen at the time but they were still calling me in for camps I wouldn't play official games but I was I was in the pool I was in the system so my mind at that time was you know there in the U.S. where they were calling me um after that, I played a year in, I played one year in college and at, at FGCU. And then I realized, all right, so it wasn't, you know, if, if I want to play professional soccer, if I really want to try to go for it, I have to try something new because I just didn't see where I was in college that it was the right spot for me to, to try to make it pro. You know, the only way was probably to go to the draft. And that's, it's not that simple, you know, to just say, Hey, I'll just get in the draft and, and find something. So I kind of, I left after my freshman year and that's when um, El Salvador contacted me that I was, you know, you, uh, an El Salvadorian born player was with the U18 national team and U20 national team. So then that's when they, you know, kind of got their attention here in the Federation of El Salvador and they contacted me that they just, um, they just qualified to go for the U20 World Cup. And if I wanted to go and, and, go and try and kind of like a trial, you know, for them to go see me, to see play. And from the first day, I was the only player that lasted that went on trial the whole three months. And then after that, I, you know, being an important player on the U20 national team, that's when kind of everything changed. And then, like you said, and then I signed with Freepo and then kind of started my, my professional career from then. So that's kind of how it all started. Who contacted you? Was it El Tuco or someone else from the Federation? It was, it was El Duco, yeah. Is that, um, how was it? Um, I think it, uh, it was a long time ago, man. I'm trying to yeah. remember. I know I'm that. I'm trying to remember too, because I know that, you know, I was, I was, I was doing select a talent, which I'm still doing. And, and you were one of the players I had. And I was working with se- several players with, um, with El Tuco, you know, like Marvin Baumgartner yeah, was a player, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maicon. And I had mentioned your name, but I had never managed to 
to get a hold of you? Uh, I mean, I know that you got there through other channels, but um, yeah, uh, I mean, know, I think yeah, they they did a couple interviews on me when I was with the U.S. national team. I don't remember who exactly or what what pages what page it was. And then kind of my name started sounding here a little bit, and then they contacted me, and then they kind of just said, um, "Hey, come, you know, this." And uh, I, once I saw that that opportunity, you know, I honestly didn't think twice about it. I thought, you know, it was great. I was eager, you know, um, I was really happy. And then from there, you know, that's how that's how it started. It was, I got, I have to go back to the messages, man. It was, a long, <laughs> it was a long time ago. I, I don't remember how it went down exactly, but something like that. Yeah. What was your parents' reactions? Was your, 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 your father, I know he's a, uh, like your number one fan, Gustavo. Um, <laughs> yeah. What was, did, did you have his full support from day one or was he like, you know, don't, you know, I want you to finish your, your college career don't do this. It was it more like, I mean, I know your, your, your father is a, a sportsman. Um, yeah. Uh, did you get his full support from, from day one or was that like a, a, a bigger conversation that had to take place? Um, no, they, I, I had my dad and my mom, both my parents support um, for sure. Um, the thing is it was tricky because I had a four year scholarship and uh at a university, which wasn't cheap, you know, and I said, if I have to go with, with, uh, with the U20 national team, it's not like I'm already going to the World Cup. I have to go. I have to try out. I have to stay there three months. I have to work. Nothing guaranteed on my part. And I'm going to leave for four years of scholarship for something that's not for sure, you know, something that's not guaranteed. It might work out. It might not. If it doesn't work out, I lose my scholarship. And I'm kind of, you know, uh, so that's the only that's the only doubt that they had. Other than that, they said, "Listen, it's your decision. We support you. Just think about this." Um, and I said, "Yeah, I know, I know. I just wanted to go." You know, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll pay for my college after. Don't worry. We're, I'll figure it out. This and that." Um, so yeah, I uh, I I left college. I went there and I came here. I think it was end of February or March, um, and I kind of was here on trial for three months until the until the world cup so i'm really happy i made that choice for me it was a no-brainer um but obviously me looking back at it now older you see like wow i left you know i uh, i had these four years guaranteed college save a lot of money and i just took it without even thinking about it it's just when you know sometimes when you're young you're just eager uh you just wanted to play and I'm, I'm I'm happy I took that decision to be honest, because that's where everything changed really. Definitely, and sometimes in life when we have to make decisions like that, it's kind of like the world or God or whatever you want to call it starts to give us like signals of whether it's we've made the right decision or we haven't. You know, what were some of the signs that you started feeling where you're like, okay, I think I think I did all right uh, making this decision. Listen, there were many times where I thought, man, I don't know what I'm doing. It, it was tough. I'm not going to lie. When I first got here at the camp, trainings were so long. They were tough. They were two and a half hours in the morning. In the afternoon, they would just go make us run. It was tiring. You know, I got sick one day, um, which always happens when I come here with the food. I got sick one day. I was something I ate didn't, didn't you know get in well I got dehydrated it was, it was tough times but after that I kept training I put a lot of effort in there were days that I said damn it's, it's all this effort really worth it you know I, I'm here I, and then I looked damn I had four years guaranteed at a nice college where over there everything was nice you know um, they took care of you and then I'm here and you know these just are things that you go with that it goes in your mind that, you know, but I said, I have to push through it. If I had this opportunity, I have to take advantage because if I do everything well, I'm going to be playing at a U20 World Cup, you know, the biggest tournament I could play in the world at somebody my age at 19 years old. Um, so, you know, those were days that I think I really grew strong mentally um, to push through things. Um, so that's how, that's how I see it. And then 
after that, I kept my promise, man. And I finished college. I actually graduated a year and a half ago from a university in Miami. No, Congrats, uh, Congrats. Yeah, at, at, at FIU, Florida International University over there. What, I what did online did because do? I was playing. So I had to do everything online, which was not, which sucked. It was tough, but hey, I got through it. So, uh, you know, I got my degree. So in that side, I'm happy and I'm still playing. So, so things worked out. We're working out very well. What'd you study? Uh, international business. Nice, nice. Well, what was that one moment where you found out that you had made the team? Could you describe that moment to us? Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember there was a time where I was here for a couple of months and I had to go back to the States because I had to do some paperwork. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I had to get back. Um, but I didn't want to leave camp because I said, damn, if I leave and, you know, I'm going to be out a week, I'm going to miss this training. Things could change because I was really in a good spot uh, to play. Um, we played against Chile and Chile over the uh, friendly and I did really well. And, and, you know, I was speaking and the coach said, listen, go, you're set, man. Just go take it easy. Come back. You're going to be here. Your spot's going to be here. And I was so relieved, you know, that knowing, all right, man, like I, I pulled through it. I'm sure the list came out a couple of weeks later. They informed us like officially a couple of weeks later, but that's kind of when I knew like, all right, they're going to take me. So I was, I was really happy. And especially I was, I was a starting player at the time. So, you know, everything was, I definitely thought, all right, all the effort was worth it for sure. Yeah, no, that must've been a great feeling. And uh, once you got to Turkey, I remember that there was a story done on you. I think it was ESPN from Argentina where they were saying you were the only Argentine to play that tournament. What was yeah. that? What was that like getting attention uh, from, from the media, from Argentina? And, and was that something that kind of pumped you up even more or what, what how did you handle that? Yeah. I mean, Argentina didn't qualify for that world cup. So I was, literally the only Argentinian in the World Cup. You know, it was, I mean, I, I never saw it that way. I just, you know, I never, that never crossed my mind. But when they asked me that, you know, it's like, oh, wow. You know, I thought it was pretty cool. But, um, I mean, it, it was strange, you know, because in Argentina they were calling me. And I have this accent, but I'm playing with El Salvador. So they're saying, how are you playing with El Salvador? And then I would explain my story. And then, you know, all that happened quickly, you know, and it was in, uh, in an, it was in ESPN. And then it came out in, in, in a newspaper called Ole. Um, and they did a, a note on me, another one, a couple months ago, taking all that back and saying how I'm going to continue with the national team at the present. And this and that and it was a really cool it was a really cool article that they did on me a couple months ago so nice. i mean I, I i i i feel proud you know uh, i feel proud because i'm representing you know the country i was born that i that identified myself strongly as as an el salvadorian but also i know that my parents and 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 my family's from argentina so you know i'm kind of representing both in a, in a way and i thought that was pretty cool in terms of uh, some of the guys on the team from back then, uh, do you stay in touch with them? Have you reconnected with any of them since you, you moved back for this tournament? Yeah, yeah. I, I speak with 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 a few, uh, especially with Coca, because we've been in the national team together last year and the year before that. So we always, every time we see each other, is a good time, man. We always show our, Do you guys speak our, in English or Spanish? No, no, no. <laughs> No, Coca doesn't speak English. Yeah, he does. We got <laughs> proof. We have proof, does man. He? he was on the does show he? a month or two ago. Really? Yes. So if you ever need to, well, then, well, no. then maybe he learned. I haven't seen him since like before the pandemic or like last year. Shout I, out to I, the yeah, Coca, by the way. Uh, yeah, man. And we would always, every time we we see each other, we just start sharing stories, like anecdotes we had from from that time, from the coach, um, silly things that would go on, you know at camp that we would just laugh, you know, the coach calling players by anything but their name because he didn't know their name and he's yelling at them and he's screaming at them and it's everything. We just share so many stories and we just laugh like, wow, 
that was you know uh, a really good time so with, with Coca I have a really good relationship with him um because he's probably the, the most because like I said I've seen him all the other guys I haven't I haven't seen them in a while actually in a very long time so uh, probably him yeah I'm nice. starting to think who else. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. I was really close also with with uh, Marvin, but I lost touch a couple of years ago. Um, there was, I mean, every now and then, obviously, we say hello. With with Heido, we were speaking um, a couple of weeks ago as well because he's in Chalate, this and that, and they contacted me as well to go over there, and he was, you know, giving me jokes, contacting me about me heading over there so we spoke and we had you know we have a really good relationship um but yeah I, I i try to keep up in touch with with most of the guys you know every once in a while for sure going back to to um coaches coaching styles in el salvador i always i mean not to disrespect anyone but i always i've been curious to have some newspaper in el salvador or or blog or or whatever uh, I'm, i'm interested in in having in knowing more about the the coaching education uh, that some of our coaches have gone through like i'm always curious because i always hear a lot of what you have have described metele con todo con huevos yeah 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 but but you know but but what's your style what's your tactic like what do you, what do you play for Um, so I'm always curious to to learn more because I, I I am a strong believer that you know the coaches make a big difference in the way the the team operates. Sometimes people say, well, you know, the players are the ones playing, and the yeah. coaches don't really matter. But we've seen it with the national team. We we saw how we play with with Albert Roca. We saw how we how we play with with um, Eduardo Lara. Uh, and then, you know, there's been some other coaches that, you know, it's like night and day when in, in terms of how the team plays. So I'm a strong believer that coaches make a big difference. But I want to focus uh, specifically on El Tuco Alfaro, because in my opinion, El Tuco has been one of the most successful Salvadorian coaches uh, in the at, at the youth level. And and. Yes, of course, he qualified to the first ever World Cup. That's a, it's a, it's a big uh, accomplishment. But even before that, he was doing some very interesting things with other teams. I mean, he almost qualified the U23 to the to the Olympics. What are your thoughts about El Tuco Alfaro in terms of his coaching style? Like, the, Is El Tuco uh, a very good coach in terms of uh, the way that his teams train, the way he he sets the 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 pieces on the the field or it just happens that he has had the luck to have a very good group of players with him in particular um you know i honestly one one good thing i liked about him um is that the you know yes he would always be yelling he would always be you know Mucho huevo, pon your huevo, this and that, yelling, getting on your ass, always, always. But there were a lot of times that he would, it would show that he would actually care for the player. You know, if he was happy, if he wasn't happy, if he was this, if he needed this, uh, which is an attribute not common here in El Salvador, you know. And I think that players, aside, you know, of, of, of everything, I think they really took that. And it's something how a coach gets to a player aside from all the tactical aside from all the trainings you know it's an important factor how the how the coach gets you know and talks with the players to see how the players are and the players obviously once they feel that connection i feel like they respond much better on the field on many things on many aspects that's one thing and then another thing i mean i was also like i'm still trying like as you asked me, I'm trying to remember everything, how trainings were with this and that at the time, because now obviously I'm a lot more experienced player now than I was back then. And maybe things that I see now, I probably wouldn't see back then or, you know, um, but aside, I felt like he was good, you know, technically, tactically, the work we would do, 
Um, I had, I personally had a good experiences with them. Uh, I honestly had a good prediction, but I've also had other players as I've moved uh, other, sorry, other coaches as I moved in my career that showed a lot more detail. And then I started learning different things about, you know, the trainings, why we train, why we do this, why we do that reasons for this reasons for that. A lot more information given to the player, a lot more work in the week before heading to the game. So, you know, later I felt a lot more prepared also than I was back then. Um, I mean, honestly, more than that, I'm not sure what I could give you as an answer. I mean, my my experience was good with him. My experience was good. Sometimes, yes, I did feel that sometimes trainings were a bit too much or uh, – I would say, you know, old school where they would just run players to the ground, you know, and they would just yell with, with Udo Wevo, this and that. But, you know, that can only take you so far in soccer, especially now, you know, and especially now that since then, a lot more, more of these countries have developed a lot more than here in El Salvador. You know, as you can see in the U.S. and you can see in Costa Rica, you can see, you know, in Honduras and Panama, you know, um, I'm probably going a bit off topic here, but I feel like all these countries have developed a lot more than um, back then because the trainings I would do back then with the U20, I'm doing here. Like, same simple things, you know? It's probably the same. It's, it's most of the same training, man. It's very... Um, I mean, I, I always enjoy these topics because, you know, I, I feel that our our country could have better uh, players, better national team, if, you know, we work more on infrastructure. For example, we, we talked about it earlier. You have a, a, a national team that is well known for having very technical players, um, not the most physical players, but yet technical players need a good feel to be able to shine, and we don't have that. Um, yeah and so that's obviously well, a big, also a big to challenge shine, but sorry also to shine but also um when you play away from home where the fields are faster you know when you go you already have the disadvantage that the other team is already used to thinking faster uh anticipating faster playing quicker playing one touch you know these are aspects that um they might seem like silly things. I've always said it here. I mean, it might seem like silly things, but they make a huge difference when you go and you play away, you know? It's not just about shining here. It's like yeah. you can't shine here, but even when you go there, you're not used to. If you, you give suffer. A player, if you give a player, you know, those fields in months, they would be 10 times better. No doubt in my mind. They would be so much better. That's, I mean, that's, I think you hit, you basically hit the spot because that's what, um, we heard this from Mayen, you know, who has been exposed to, to nicer fields. So it, it almost makes me want to start a project to improve all the fields, honestly, because I, I mean, probably the last game against the U.S. is not the best example, but in a way it is because I, I think that other than maybe our players being out of rhythm and not fit necessarily for that game, we we always suffer when we go outside of El Salvador and you play on under very nice conditions and we have a hard time adapting to the speed of the of the game yeah um, it's it's sorry it's about it's about everything you know the, the speed of the game is just it comes subconsciously as a player when you go and the ball is moving so fast because you know when to shift, how to shift, at what speed to shift. If you don't shift, for example, in my position as a center mid, if I don't shift, cover enough, quick, like uh, quickly the middle, the ball gets through the forward, and then suddenly they're on a one and one with the defender. You know, it's just little details that you know people watching from outside they just watch the ball, and they probably don't watch the movements of of all the other players. You know, when these things, like I said, it, it it changes physically, but also mentally, and it gets you to think a lot quicker um, when you're playing there. And, well, you said that Mayan said it as well. And then here, you know, here sometimes you could go into games, man, and the ball is flat, you know, and balls are, are not pumped uh, or and they're old and they feel like balloons. And then you say, all right, 
So I can't make this pass because the ball won't go where I want it. So now I have to kind of figure it out and I have to play my partner in the air because I don't know how it's going to roll instead of automatically playing that ball one touch without even, you know, thinking about, and uh, you know, you're just thinking about the appointment, the, the, the opponent, everything else comes natural, you know? And when you think about this and then you go to a nice field, it's just, and that's why I think the example you use with against the U.S. Yes, I understand that the national team had, you know, two days of preparation. It's the U.S. was there two weeks um, training, practicing this and that. But I still don't think that the difference of the level is six goals. I think it was what six goals. It was six zero, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. I don't think the difference is there. I think if you give the national team players, you give them three weeks there, two weeks, I think the game's completely different. You know, at least they're 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 settling. You know, I'm not saying it would be a win for El Salvador, no, but I'm saying that they would have shown a different face, you know, and that that um even though I wasn't part of that group, it, it stresses me out because, you know, outside they see as a Salvador, oh, wow, 6-0 against a U23 US. And it's, no, they're not, these players are not that bad. It's just, you know, the situations, you have to give them time, you have to give them, you know, these are other factors. It's not so much the level of the players because they're not used to it. You know, they were playing here on, on fields that are completely different, on the speed of play that's completely different. And you can't expect them to just go there and, and especially on the young U.S. team that was flying, that these kids came out flying, you know. Yeah. So, um, it, I, I said, and I, I don't say it to everybody. I think these are, you know, it might seem like something silly, but it's a big factor. Definitely, it's a big factor for sure. And then moving forward with with La Selecta, um. And obviously you're in country now. I bet you know you're you're hoping to be to be called up. What are your hopes in terms of uh, being called up, and how do you manage that? And um, what do you think about the the new round that's been given to Isabel instead of being part of a classic hexagonal? Now that there's an additional round, and now it's going to be an octagonal in case Isabel is able to make it through. Um, what do you think about all that? Um, first of all, I see myself like, um, uh, you know, if, if I get called up, I see myself with, with great confidence really, um, to be there. Um, I started, I had, I was in part of the group the last two years. I started against Peru 2019, where we won two zero. And then last year we only had two games against Iceland, which I started and we lost one zero which we had, I think, a really good game that day. And then we lost, uh, well, and then the U.S. that I didn't get called. So me knowing that, kind of familiar with the coach, with the players, you know, naming this because I know how they work. I know how they are. The players, you get to know them. And that gives you, you know, like tranquility and confidence heading into into the games if you get called up. Um, and these games that, that, that are coming up, um, I mean – they're not easy. I know that going to these islands and, and to play, they're not easy, but we have to, we have to get results. There's no other, there's no other option. We have to get results and we have to work. And uh, I really hope that, you know, uh, the players that get called up uh, if I'm there or if I'm not there, that they actually get the work that they need to get prepared for, for these games. Because I, I think, I think we have a really good team. Uh, you know, name for name. I think we have a strong team, uh, a lot stronger than people think. That's for sure. So, and I want, I want to, I want for, you know, the world everywhere outside to see how good, you know, of a team that El Salvador can be, you know? Yeah. To move away from, you know, like a result, like, you know, from December. Um, let's see. Do you have anything else we will? Because we're almost at an hour that we don't take too much more of your time. Yeah, I do have um, a question about your your experience in the the United States, and what do you think are the factors that are preventing Salvadorian players from making that jump to MLS? Um, you know, like in, in your experience, you you've been part of a, a couple of uh, 
MLS uh, own uh, USL clubs you know, such as the Timbers and and uh, the Rangers. I mean, when you were at the Timbers, I thought you know that you would be like a kind of like a natural replacement uh, for Valeri. Um, and like, because you you've had, I mean, you've you've had minutes at USL. Uh, you played a good amount of games. Like, what do you think are some of those factors that are, you know, preventing players like you from making that jump into the MLS? Well, I think first of all, something that would help. Speaking for everybody, for other Salvadoran players, you know, once a reputation of the national team gets stronger, I think they would see the El Salvadorian player differently. You know, once, you know, if, if, if the national team has a good run or for a couple of years or for a while, or imagine they head to a world cup, you know, they see, they would see a Salvadorian player differently um, with probably giving more opportunities than, than they actually give them today. And that's, I think that's, that's the truth. You know, they don't, they don't see a, uh, they don't value an El Salvadorian player the same as a Costa Rican player. You know, they don't look that much into El Salvador as they look into Costa Rica, you know, or Honduras or or Panama. Um, that's, I think that's my opinion. And then the other were personally, well, you know, it, I thought that, uh, you know, when I was in, in sporting and in, in the Swope Park Rangers, you know, I would train with the first team, but I would play with, with Swope Park Rangers. You know, I would play, I played CONCACAF Champions League with Sporting Kansas City. Three days later, I'm playing the final of USL Championship. Um, and then after that, you know, they tell me that, you know, they're really interested that they want to bring me in for the first team for next year. A couple of days, you know, before, like months later, it didn't work out. They just didn't give me a reason. You know, they just said, hey, man, you know, we're not going to take you kind of out of nowhere. And I said no to other MLS teams at the time, hoping that, you know, everything was still going on with with sporting because we were speaking about, you know, first team contract. And I was doing really well that year. And, you know, those sometimes are opportunity where also I feel a player needs a little bit of luck for just things to go his way because they know how you are. You did what you have to do playing. You know, you can't do much more than that. It didn't work out. And then when I went to Portland, um, I started really good. And like I said, I would train with the first team. They would, you know, see me for a future there with the, uh, with, with the first team. It's it's not easy also because the guy playing in front of you was Chara, Diego Chara, and he had, you know, four years left contract with almost a million dollars each year. And you know that he's going to play and he has the spot for the next three, four years. So, you know, that window is not so easy to just go and break through. Um, and aside from there, um, they brought a new coach. Uh, that coach they didn't want me. The other guy, Caleb Porter, that was, you know, I was speaking with at the time. He left to Columbus. Gio came as a new coach. And, you know, uh, I guess he he didn't want to uh, take me in. So I was a bit of unlucky there. You know, maybe if, if the other coach would have stayed, I probably would have gotten a shot, you know. Um but it, it is what it is, man. It is what it is. It's soccer. And I think that my personal experience uh, does those how it works. Those, you know, I can only speak about my personal experience about that. And in terms for for the future, what are some of the goals that you have? Uh, obviously, the national team is something that you hope is on, on the horizon for you. But in terms of uh, club level, you know, are you hoping to be able to make the jump to leagues, uh, whether it's MLS or uh, Central America, maybe Guatemala, or are you hoping at some point to even be able to play in Argentina? Yeah, I mean, I'm always looking to grow as a player. You know, now that I'm, I'm playing here, I'm, you know, my ambition is always to be playing uh, a first division in a really good team in South America, in Europe, you know, in, in MLS somewhere that in my value just keeps growing up. Uh, it's something that my main focus is. And then that, and always try to be part with, with the national team, you know, and um, those, are, those are my goals. Um, I would like to be playing, you know, first division in Europe as well, 
you know, to have that experience, to have that, you know, I could, I definitely think I could see soccer as a new way. You know, I had experience in, in the U.S. I have experience here in El Salvador, you know, having maybe an experience in Europe, I think could be something really interesting. Um, so you never know. That could be something that, that could happen in, in the near future. For sure, man. Well, I don't want to take too much more of your time because it's already been an hour. But just want to say thank you so much for, for chatting with us, uh, especially since you've been feeling a little bit under the weather. And yeah, yeah just want to wish you the best of luck for this tournament because, yeah, it is exciting to see players of your level being signed in El Salvador. Um, recently, we saw that uh, Dostin Correa was uh, re-signed or made it another comeback to FAS. So it'll be interesting how you guys work things out in the midfield there or if he plays up top. Um, and, yeah best best of luck this this tournament and and i uh, hope you get to enjoy it a lot man yeah i appreciate you guys i had a good time i think it's a really cool topic that we do it especially doing it in english i think it's something different um but no man these these talks are great i think uh, it's really important for people to see this as well um these talks are really cool they're great and people get to know players, you know, and their point of views on, on all these good questions that you guys have. So uh, thanks, you guys, for having me. And, you know, hopefully in the near future, we could do another one for sure. Definitely. I mean, with all, all the match days for the national team coming up, hopefully we'll be able to analyze stuff or talk things through of, of how things are going on. But, yeah, man, take it easy. Sure. Have a great night. I hope you feel better. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. See you. Thank you. All right. See you. Well, that was an interview, everybody, with Tomás Granito, midfielder for Club Deportivo FAS, recent signing, and a player that has recently emerged with the senior squad after having a successful run for the U-20s um, back in 2013. So it's great to see him, you know, fully Im immersing himself in and so it seems that he's has his goals set in terms of what steps he wants to take in order to get back into full consideration for La Selecta, as well as the steps he wants to take to further his, his own career, whether in a several order or abroad. Yeah, yeah, I hope that he um, takes advantage of, of this opportunity to be closer to the national team. Uh, no excuses, you know, from the, from the coaching staff that they can see him because he's playing abroad in the a league that maybe doesn't get enough uh, coverage. So he's, he's there. Uh, I, I think that is always a good move uh, despite all the challenges that, that the league has in terms of infrastructure. And we, we, we keep hearing it over and over how that, you know, plays a, a role in, in the way our players develop. I think that it's a, it's a brave move. And it's an opportunity to get closer to the national team. This is the perfect time to do that. We have the qualifiers around the corner. We have the Gold Cup. So I, I think there's no better time to be playing in El Salvador to, you know, make, make it back into the national team and, and play the qualifiers. Uh, there's no better um, platform to make a return to a, uh, a higher league than playing for your national team. So I think it's a smart move. Just geographically being closer, having that access. And also, you know, now that it seems that the league is working better in tandem with the national team in terms of the loaning of players for the microcyclos, I think that's a good idea too, because that's one thing that players abroad run into that since they're away, they're not official match days. They don't have to be loaned out. And that sometimes can affect, you know, your ability or your, your possibilities of being called up for the most important stuff. If the coach can't have that, that access to you, I think it's something that's a little out phased, you know, but at the same time, due to the reality and infrastructure and, and the conditions in the country, it does make sense that in order to be closer to, you know, in, to increase your, your ability, it almost sounds counterintuitive, right? But in order to increase your chances to be called up, it, it does seem like there's a benefit to being closer or active 
considering that a lot of leagues are still iffy or a lot of people haven't been active within the United States because soccer has been over for the MLS for a while and even more so for the second and third divisions out there. Well, and with that, folks, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, Hope you enjoyed this episode. Once again, we really appreciate you taking the time and listening, liking, subscribing, uh, sharing that word of mouth because we're slowly and surely building up a following And even with those that we have now, we truly appreciate you taking that time because if we don't feel like we're just talking into a mic or a computer screen, it it does feel great to get that feedback, knowing that we're connecting with fans and that that there is space to talk about La Selecta and Salvadoran soccer in English. It's something that at least I don't know if it exists or I haven't seen it exist prior. And it does feel great to be able to move something like this along. I was talking with Julito Pinto the other day and he, he was like, no, this seems like a great project. I think it's something innovative, but I just can't get into the English. So I don't listen to you, but anyway, much love to Julio Pinto. And, and that's true. I mean, something like this isn't necessarily meant to be this broad, type of podcast it's, we realize it's something that has a small niche when we started out with this podcast and the cool thing is it seems like we're reaching out to that niche and we're getting that that those compliments or that interaction and that's why we're doing this so thanks again and part of that that I mentioned is um, I got reached out to by one of our listeners um, junior juniors junior he hit me up on Instagram and he he actually invited us to an event taking place tomorrow. Unfortunately, uh, for lack of time, uh, neither Ugo or myself will be able to uh, participate, but it seems like an interesting space along the lines of kind of what we do here of speaking about Salvador and footy. It's an event for a clubhouse drop-in audio. You can actually find the link for it on Vinco Vinco Realty, hashtag not a sponsor yet on Twitter. Um, but basically the event that he was inviting us to is you know, some former uh, U.S.-based Salvadoran players uh, take a space to talk about, you know, life after soccer and the business ventures that that people get involved in once, you know, maybe their careers reach a, a certain pinnacle or, or threshold. So it's interesting, you know, Salvadorans getting together uh, to talk about business and networking and, you know, things that you can do beyond your love of soccer because you know we live in interesting times we all have to find different side hustles and be multifaceted so if you want to check out that link again it's at at vv realty group on twitter i'll be resharing this on our twitter as well but yeah shout out to juniors junior for listening in and inviting us to that event and oh any closing thoughts before we head on out just just appreciating all of our listeners uh, we hope to get more listeners. If you have any any guests that you'd like us to have in the show, let us know. Uh, we'll we'll do our best to to have them in the show and and get to know a little bit more about their life and and talk about what we love: Salvadorian soccer and English. Yeah, and you know whether it's English or Spanish, Salvadoran soccer fans are very passionate. Obviously, we're very opinionated. I've gotten comments about, oh, your music's depressing. Change it, change this, change that. I've gotten positive feedback as well in the same comment. So in any (laughs) case, I mean, we appreciate any type of interactions that we have with you because, you know, it, it knows it makes us it indicates to us that this content's hitting somewhere and we truly appreciate it. And just to close out, have a great week.